All right, so while you're getting signed in, just quick review, because we talked about the big three methods of cellular transport yesterday. Okay, and the big three methods were diffusion, osmosis, and active transport. So just a quick review of how those worked. Okay, osmosis transports only water. Right? That's kind of its key identifying characteristic, is that it only transports water. And it does so across the cell's membrane. Okay? And the reason that this water would move across the membrane is it's trying to balance salt concentrations, balance solutes on both sides. Right? So if it's salty outside of the cell, water moves outside of the cell. Okay? If there's no salt outside of the cell, water moves into the cell. Right? It's always moving in the direction of the higher salt concentration. Okay? It is a passive process, which means it doesn't take any energy, but also the cell can't control it. Okay? Diffusion, probably the most important of the big three because it is the one that cells use most often, and it transports things internally from place to place within the cell. And it's the one that our activity today is gonna to be about, okay? So diffusion moves any material, okay? Any material can move by diffusion, right? It is passive and it always involves moving from high concentration to low concentration. So wherever a material is produced, it would be in high concentration. Wherever it is needed, it would be in low concentration. So it's naturally gonna move in generally the right direction, okay? But we did say that there were drawbacks, right? One of the drawbacks to diffusion is that it is slow. And the other drawback to it is it's not targeted. That means we can't say, all right, it's addressed to this part of the cell and it's going to go directly there, right? It's more like um, I throw it up into the air and hope the wind carries it where it's supposed to, okay? So it's not a targeted process, okay? That said, it's okay as long as the distance it has to travel is short, okay? And as long as we're talking about normal size cells, the distance is pretty short. Cells aren't very big, right? So this can work as long as cells don't get overly large, okay? The third uh, transport process was active transport. That's the one that the cell uses energy for, okay? And it's actively pumping materials across the membrane from low concentration to high concentration. So it's like pumping uphill, okay? So that one uses a lot of energy. It moves against the gradient. It's active, okay? So it's basically the opposite of the other two. All right, is that ringing a bell from yesterday? All right, so like we said, our activity today is gonna be about transport within the cell. We want to look at what is the effect of increasing cell size on a cell's ability to transport effectively by diffusion. All right, so common sense would say as a cell gets bigger, its ability to transport by diffusion would diminish, yeah, decrease. It's not going to do it as well. Okay, so kind of looking at that from a practical perspective, okay? Cells absorb nutrients and excrete wastes through their membrane. Okay, so through their outer layer, that's their surface area. It is, okay, ascent, I mean, it's sort of three-dimensional, but it's, it's a, a, essentially a single membrane. Everything has to get in or out through that layer, all right? So that is their surface area, okay? But they have to transport whatever they absorb or whatever they're looking to get rid of through their cytoplasm. That would be their internal volume. okay? That is a three-dimensional space, okay? So we're looking at comparing a two-dimensional space surface area with a three-dimensional space volume, okay? So as a cell size increases, volume's gonna increase faster than surface area does, okay? Think about this, how do we calculate surface area? Like if I got a, a rectangle, length times width, okay? And how do I calculate volume? Length times width times height. All right, so if, an ob if I'm looking at an object and I make it bigger, which gets bigger faster, surface area or volume? If I, if I make it like, let's say it's a cube and I make it a little bit bigger, okay, I'm only multiplying two numbers that are bigger together to calculate surface area. But in terms of volume, all three of these numbers get bigger and now I'm multiplying three bigger numbers together, right? So it sells volume increases 
like exponentially faster than its surface area does as it grows. So comparatively, as the cell gets bigger, its ability to absorb materials decreases and so does its ability to transport those materials because now it's got an even bigger volume of, through which it has to transport the materials. So if I'm looking at two different cells here, I'm looking at a nice small cell and I'm looking at a really, really big cell. Okay? They contain the same amount of organelles, but one is bigger. So let's say that I need to get a material from this X to this square in the big cell. Right? And it can only get there by diffusion. Is that a fairly large distance in this big cell, like compared to the small cell? Right? It's considerably bigger. And I have to remember that by diffusion, okay, that substance will be very concentrated here at its source. But by the time it gets here, that same number of green dots now looks like that. It spreads out. Remember, by diffusion, it's not going from A to B. It's going from A to everywhere. Right? So it's getting very, very spread out by the time it gets there. In this smaller cell, it's going from here to there, which is a smaller distance. So this thing can produce just as many of those green dots. By the time they get to here, they spread out a little bit but not nearly as badly. A lot more of them actually arrive at the final destination than do in a bigger cell. Okay, does that sort of make sense to everybody? Okay, so this is typically why cells don't reach abnormally large sizes, why you don't have an amoeba sitting in the desk next to you. Okay, they can't get that big because unlike ourselves, they don't have a complex multi-celled circulatory system that helps pump materials from place to place through blood vessels and, and whatever else. Okay, they can only move material by diffusion. If we depended on that to survive, we would die. Okay, think about how long it would take for food energy that's down here in your stomach to diffuse to your brain against gravity, mind you. Okay, the chances of that happening are pretty slim. Right? That's why we have a circulatory system that uses energy and actively transports material from one place to another in the body. Diffusion's just not going to get that done over those kind of distances. Okay. All right. Any questions on that kind of setup there? Okay. So here's where you're going to want to start putting some things into your uh, little activity sheet there. Okay. So the problem we're investigating is how does the surface area relate to volume in cells of different sizes? Would dividing a large cell into smaller cells affect the surface area to volume ratio? Okay, so if I'm like looking at these two cubes here, they're the same size, but one is only a single cell and the other is made up of a whole bunch of little cells. Okay, does that increase the surface area of or the surface area to volume ratio in that organism? Okay. Like every single one of those little cells has six sides, like if we're talking about cubes, okay, as opposed to having one big cell that has six sides and this massive internal volume. Okay. So that's what we're going to kind of be looking at. So for our hypothesis, okay, if, and, and then statement, okay, the if part of our hypothesis has to be about how cells transport materials internally. Okay. What process did they use for that? this one. I would say your if part should probably talk about that. Okay. If cells do this. Okay. And so the if part is going to talk about transport by diffusion. All right. The and part is basically going to talk about how we're going to compare these kind of theoretical organisms here. Micro, macro, and multi-micro are our theoretical organisms here. Okay. The main idea is what needs to go in the then part. So in the then part, we need to talk about how a, an organism's surface area compares to its volume as it gets bigger. Okay. And we just talked about that a minute ago. We said one of those things increases a lot faster than the other. Okay. So essentially in the then part, you need to say, um, which is more important, having a large surface area and a small volume or having a 
large volume and a small surface area, which is which is kind of better for a cell to transport. Okay, so what we're going to do is together, we're going to do the math on these three organisms. We are going to look at their surface area to volume ratio. Okay, so we're going to calculate their surface areas, we're going to calculate their volumes, and then we're going to make it a ratio. How many square centimeters to cubic centimeters Okay, for each organism? Okay, the higher that number, or, or let's say the more in favor of surface area that number is, the better that organism can transport material. Okay, so if, if we're looking at like three to one surface area to volume, that's awesome. Okay, if we're looking at like one to 10, that's terrible. Okay, we want to have more surface area compared to volume. Okay, so the next thing you see on your sheet is this chart. Okay, we're gonna fill it in right now. Okay, so our cube names are micro, macro and multi-micro, okay? Their dimensions are shown in that diagram there. Micro is one micrometer by one micrometer by one micrometer, okay? So it's a very small single cell, like ridiculously small, right? Macro is 10 by 10 by 10, and so is multi-micro, okay? Macro and multi-micro are the same size. What's different is that multi-micro is made up of many small parts, okay? So what we'd essentially be saying is macro is a very large single-celled organism. Multi-micro is a similarly sized multicellular organism. All right, so if I want to calculate the surface area of a cube, I go length times width times, nope, I'm trying to find surface area. Length times width times the number of sides, okay, because they're all squares. All right, so I go one times one times six sides. So the surface area of micro is six square micrometers. Uh, just put UM. Yeah, UM is fine. Uh, for squared, put a two there and then go into um, the tools or format. And up in there should be superscript. So highlight the two and then superscript it. I don't know what the shortcut key is for that. Uh, control, uh, period. control period? Okay. Control comma. Control comma. Okay, control comma will superscript it. So highlight the two and then go control comma and it'll pop it up to superscript. Okay. Oh. So it is period. Okay, sorry. Control period. We'll get it right. You can just put a U there. It's fine. There's actually a symbol you can insert, but it takes forever to find it. So put U. I know what you mean, Mu. It's all good. All right. Now I want to calculate the volume of micro. Well, it's one by one by one. So all I have to do is go one times one times one, which is one. All right. So the volume of micro is one cubic micrometer. All right, so our ratio then of surface area to volume is six to one, which is awesome. Okay, that means we have lots of surface area to absorb and excrete materials in a very small volume through which to transport them. Okay, so kind of the ideal situation for an organism using diffusion to transport material. 
Okay, looking at macro. Macro is 10 by 10 by 10, and it's a cube. So its surface area will be 10 times 10 times the number of sides, 6. So 10 times 10 is 100 times 6, 600 square micrometers. Okay, and then what's the volume? 1,000, right. Okay, it's gonna be 10 times 10 times 10. So it'll be 1,000 cubic micrometers. All right, what's our ratio there? Six to 10, yeah, or 0. 0.6 to one, right? If we wanna make it all to, always to one so we can compare, okay? 0. 0.6 to one, is that better or worse? way worse, okay? Like really, really bad, in fact. Our surface area is smaller than our volume. Okay? And we said that is not a good situation. Okay? So there's a large volume through which materials have to be transported in macro and very little surface area over which to absorb and excrete material. Okay, multi-micro is where it gets a little bit tricky. Multi-micro's volume is exactly the same, right? It's 10 by 10 by 10. So we can put in that it's 1,000 cubic micrometers. Okay? That's not the hard part. Its surface area is not the same as macros. Because instead of being one cube, it's how many cubes? Actually, it's 1,000 cubes, because it's 10 cubes on a side. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's ten cubes on the side. Okay, so there's a thousand micros inside of this thing. Each one having six sides. So what's the total surface area in this one? Six thousand. Okay, each micro has a surface area of six square micrometers, and there are a thousand of them. Now, probably some of you are saying, but Mr. Kader, some of those are trapped inside. They're not all on the outside. It doesn't matter. In an organism, even if cells are squished together, there's still interstitial fluid. That is, fluids in the space between the cells. They're never right together, right? So they do have all of their sides exposed. So the surface area here is 6,000 square micrometers. What's our ratio at? Six to one. Okay, we're back to that like ideal number again. So does a multicellular organism have an advantage over a similarly sized single-celled organism? Yeah, in terms of being able to transport materials and have a good surface area to volume ratio, definitely. Oh, sorry, that is not supposed to be a three. That is supposed to be a two. Squared is a two. All right, you actually get five marks for that chart, so I hope everybody filled it in because I kind of gave you those. Okay. All right, so the rest of this thing is basically you analyzing these numbers and then looking at a couple of different shapes as well. Okay. So you've got to type out answers for these analysis questions. Analysis question number one is asking you, when you increase from micro to macro, so when you're going from the small cube to the big cube, okay, the increase is a factor of 10. That is, each side is 10 times bigger than in the smaller cube, right? What's the factor for the increase of surface area and volume? So you go back to this chart. Factor means how many times bigger is the surface area of macro than micro? How many times bigger is the volume of micro than macro? Okay, you just have to write in the numbers there. Okay. For question number two, Okay, it's saying for both of the big cubes, so for macro and multi-micro, the size and volume are the same. That is, they have the same dimensions. Okay, that's what they mean by factor of one. They're the same size. Calculate the factor for the difference between the surface area of these cubes. So how many times bigger is the surface area of multi-micro than macro? Okay, again, it's just a number, so it's an easy thing. Question number three, for which two cubes does the ratio between the volume and the surface area change when you make them bigger. So only two of the three cubes, okay? So only two of these three, when you make them bigger, 
will have their surface area to volume ratio change. Now, I need you to think about that. That means basically talking about growth. If micro grows, it could become macro, yes? If macro grows, it gets even worse, but it's just a much bigger single cube. When multi-micro grows, do the individual cells get bigger or does the thing get bigger and fill the extra space with new cells? Yeah, as a multicellular organism, you grow not by making your cells bigger, but by making more cells, okay? So if you make a whole bunch more cells that are all the same size, what happens to your surface area to volume ratio? Does it change or not? Give me a little explanation on question number three, okay? Okay, number four is asking about this diagram right here. I have put the sizes on. I don't think they're in your, um, your thing there. So you'll need these to calculate the surface area and volume of each one of those shapes. Okay, now they're not cubes, so it's not length times width times the number of sides anymore. Okay, if I want to calculate, let's say for this long one, the surface area, I've got to calculate the surface area of this side and the back, they'd be the same, so we'd multiply it by two, okay? The surface area of this long side, and its partner on the other side, so multiply it by two, and the surface area of the top and bottom, okay? So, and then add them all up, okay? So you get, it's a little bit more geometry, okay? You should remember from grade five, you won't have any problem, okay? But you gotta find all of those, and then their volume is simple, length times width times height, okay, for all of them. So what we're trying to figure out in number four is, does the shape of a cell affect its surface area to volume ratio? Because when you calculate the volumes of these three cells, they're very close, okay? Like essentially they're the same volume, right? But their surface areas may or may not be the same. So what we want to find out is, does changing the shape of a cell, can that affect its surface area to volume ratio? Question number five is basically saying, all right, you did that with these three imaginary cells. Here's three real cells that essentially look like that. So a liver cell is like box A, a skin cell is like box B, a nerve cell is like box C, okay? You have some nerve cells in your body that run from the base of your brain to the small of your back, single cells, okay? So they're like a meter long but they're only really big in one dimension, like box C. If they're really small in the other dimensions, can they still handle this surface area to volume thing? Okay, that's what question number five is asking. Okay, question six is asking about the shape of a red blood cell and whether its shape does a good job of increasing its surface area because red blood cells carry oxygen on the outside of their membranes. Okay, so the more surface area they have, the more oxygen they can carry. Does that shape help or hinder that job? And explain why. Okay, seven's probably the most important one, okay? And it's about what we've been talking about the last two days. Materials get from place to place in a cell by diffusion, okay? If you had a low surface area and a big volume, okay, how would that affect the ability to transport material? Talk about it a couple sentences, okay? Then your conclusion and you're done. There's no sources of error because we didn't actually do an experiment. Okay, questions on this? Okay, realistically, you should be pretty close to done this thing by the end of class today. Okay? I'm giving you the rest of the period to work on it. It's not due till Tuesday, but realistically, you should be very close to done by the end of class. Okay, in fact, lots of times I've just said it's due at the end of class. I'm not gonna do that, okay, because we had a quiz today and that ate up a little bit of time. Right? but you should be pretty close to done by the end of class. So it's not meant to be a bunch of homework. Any questions before I let you go on that? Okay, if there are questions while you're working, just ask. No. Oh, sorry, did I leave it blank? No, you just, you didn't. I was just wondering if you did. No, I've, if the problem is on, the, is on there, then you don't have to worry about it. So no, you don't have to do it, okay? You just have... The hypothesis, there's no variables, right? There's no manipulator responding. You don't have to worry about that. It's just hypothesis. We already did the calculations for the chart. Okay, answer the analysis question to the conclusion. 